recording, Alex, Derek. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. OK, so welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the online safeguarding forum for schools and education settings. And uh, as I say, this is a pilot that we're running this term and uh, alongside the in-person forum. So uh, we're pleased to have you with us. Thank you for joining. OK, um, next slide, please. So as usual, the um, I'll be doing a, an update on safeguarding. So bringing to you sort of all the key highlight information I think you need to um, be aware of at this particular point in the in the term and academic year. Now, the online uh, session is shorter than the in-person session, so we're not able to go into the level of detail that that we go into um, at, at the quadrant forums. So just to be aware of that, um, but uh, you will receive a copy of all the slides and they'll be on Essex School Info Link uh, in, in the secure area for anyone who wants to access, for anyone watching the recording. Um, as I say, if there are any questions, then do ask us as we go through and we'll pick it up through the chat. OK, thanks, uh, Derry. So I thought it would be helpful to have a look at the uh, keeping children safe in education for September, because as always, there will be a new version. Um, by the time we have the forums next term, you will have been running for half a term. So uh, so I thought it'd be helpful to look at it now, just so you're aware of the main changes in the document. I have to say the changes this year are relatively minor and they are they, they've been made in order to ensure the document is consistent with other statutory guidance and, and other documentation and legislation. So uh, there, uh, there, there, there aren't actually many changes for this year, which is um, which is quite nice, really. Um, having said that, the DfE have just closed their consultation on the keeping safe, uh, keeping children safe in education for 2025, for September 2025. And again, I will talk a little bit about that just so you're aware of what's in that document. But let's go through, uh, let's go through for this September 1st. So, um, First of all, the definition of safeguarding has um, ha has been updated to reflect the changes in the updated uh, working together document. And they there there are two. You'll you'll see the definition in the new document, but there are actually um, two additions to the um, to the definition, and. Um, they are the, the it, it does refer specifically to the um, uh, to to the uh, national social care uh, framework, which is a document that was shared earlier this year. Oh, don't know what happened there. Sorry. Uh, that was shared uh, shared earlier this year, and and that document is a response to the social care strategy. Uh, stable homes built on love. So you can go online and have a look at both those documents if you wanted to have a look at it in a bit more detail. But um, but but keeping children safe, as I say, will reflect the new definition uh, come this September. Uh, I've put the paragraph numbers here so that you can go in and have a look at the um, at the section I'm talking about if you want to in a, in a bit more detail. Uh, so, as you can see there, paragraph uh, 18, again, the, the section around early help, it's been amended to reflect the working together guidance and uh, there's more information there around early help. Paragraph 19, it's that the, the, the paragraph in itself isn't new. It talks about the fact that all staff should be aware of the indicators of abuse and neglect. But as you can see there, it's added and exploitation. So. It, exploitation is now explicitly listed as a separate uh, type of abuse. Paragraph 24, 
relates to domestic abuse and um, this has been included and updated in response to the Domestic Abuse Act which is a key document because children are recognised for the first time uh, as victims in their own right and this paragraph reflects that in terms of including what children see here or experience um, in terms of domestic abuse and the impact that can have on them. And then paragraph uh, 29, it's uh, again, not, not a new um, section, not new wording, but it, it redefines absence as unexplainable and or persistent absences from education. And that replaces the previous wording of deliberately missing education. And again, that, that ties in with um, other uh, statutory guidance and, and in this case it's around the working together to improve attendance documentation. Thanks Terry. So additional information in paragraph 93 around GDPR and, and data protection guidance and then paragraph 171 uh, again it's additional information uh, about when a school places a child on an alternative prov provision so with a, another provider and it is uh, reinforcing the school the, ho the, the holding school the owning school's responsibility for the safeguarding of that pupil and their responsibility in ensuring that the placement meets meets the needs of that particular child. So I'll just uh, take this opportunity to remind you of the guidance document from the uh, education access team around placing a child at an alternative provision. Um, it talks about uh, safeguarding and, and how uh, the, the, the owning school should undertake its duties in that respect. There are <laughs> model templates um, and, uh, and appendices in there. Risk, there's a model risk assessment, um, <clears throat> model agreement uh, uh, that the schools may want to use. I think what I'd want to say on that is that it's really vital that uh, discussions are held early on with the, with the new provider and uh, that everyone is very clear, including the child, including the parents, about what the safeguarding arrangements for, for that child will be. So your considerations are, does the provision meet the child's needs? And then what will their safeguarding uh, arrangements look like? There is, um, as I say, there is a model risk assessment and I think uh, it, it's important that parents and the pupil concerned are given the opportunity to contribute to that. And certainly there should be discussion with them uh, about, uh, about those arrangements so that they have an opportunity to, um, to, to consider that and, and contribute. Ofsted are still very interested in, um, in children accessing their education offer on, off site, whether that's full or part time. <clears throat> and there may be a mix of both, of course, in some in some cases, but they will want to um, they will want to uh, look at pupils who are accessing their education elsewhere. Often they will be phoning the other provider to uh, to check what you're telling them about what the safeguarding arrangements are and uh, you know they, 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 they may call those cases and look at them in some detail that's not why we have to get this right we have to get this right so that the children are safe but uh, as I say Ofsted are interested in looking at that so paragraph 204 is a new link um, to the NSPCC which provides advice on safeguarding for children with um, with SEND and then paragraph 205 to 209 is in relation to um, LGBTQ and gender questioning and that has uh, that, that additional information reflects the gender questioning uh, guidance that is currently out in draft form from the um, from the DfE so it will be interesting to see what 
that looks like come September in terms of the finalised document. Uh, I mean, all this is subject to change, of course, because the the current 2024 version is a draft document and it might look different in September. But I think specifically around that uh, section, there is a bit more of a question, really. OK, thanks, Derry. So let's have a look at the consultation for 2025 then. So the DfE, it, it actually closed earlier this uh, this week, no, it didn't. It closed last week, whenever the 20th was, last week. Um, so the DfE have said that um, keeping children safe in education is, uh, it is school and colleges guidance um, to help them identify concerns early, um, develop relationships with other professionals and to, uh, to ensure there are appropriate processes in place. They've said it's deliberately broad. The, um, the consultation and that it is in response to new risks emerging around safeguarding. And I think uh, in particular, I mean, there is the risk in the community, but um, I think much of that relates to um, technology and uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, you know, other things. There's lots of research going on around pupil use of mobile phones and you know, we, we will see what that looks like in terms of the guidance coming out from the DfE, but there's quite a bit of noise around that at the moment as well. The, the guidance seeks to reflect issues that have been raised with the DfE by professionals working with children. And it also seeks to uh, to respond to the wider systemic changes and, and, and it specifically references the Ofsted consultation, the big listen to ensure that there is um, better alignment be between uh, between Ofsted and safeguarding policy and, and the Keeping Children Safe document. Thanks, Derry. So we don't have time to cover what's in the consultation, and some of you may have been on and had a look at that yourselves and contributed to it, but these are the key um, topics that they are covering. So in terms of the role of the DSL, uh, it's asking about, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but it's asking about uh, support for the DSLs where, where you access supervision. It talks about how, um, where, whether it's, uh, uh, whether, you, whether you have a teaching post or whether the DSL role is a full-time post, I think probably you would all say it is. But whether you have other duties alongside that, and I know that many of you have many other duties alongside your DSL role, but it, it, it is asking about that. It also asks uh, about how DSLs work with other safeguarding partners. And I just wanted to take a minute to talk about arrangements in Essex, really, at this point, because in Essex, we have a, a strong system, I think, in terms of the voice of our education settings being heard. So just a reminder for you that um, in Essex, the uh, safeguarding arrangements in every organisation are, are, are overseen by the Essex Safeguarding Children Board, the ESCB, and we within the education safeguarding team work really closely with the ESCB and, and have done for, for many years now. So Claire Kershaw and myself sit on the executive board. The head teacher associations are also represented at that uh, executive board. So Ash, Eva and Esset do have representation at, at the board. And then there are a number of subcommittees that sit under the ESCB. And, uh, and and I sit on most of those. Matt Lewis in my team, who, who many of you will know, he also sits on the um, uh, the quadrant stay safe groups, which are also a subcommittee of the ESCB. And um, and in terms of uh, working with statutory partners, so. Many of you will know that education is not currently a, a statutory safeguarding partner. It has been talked about for a long while, actually. Um, previously, um, 
prior to the to, to the current version of working together. Um, but in the in the latest version of working together that came out at the end of last year, it does refer to education being becoming a statutory partner uh, alongside the current statutory partners of health, social care and police. And uh, <clears throat> as I say, in Essex, I think we already um, ha have, a, have a voice with the statutory partners, but alongside our existing arrangements that I've just set out, we are also um, being invited, Claire, Claire Kershaw and myself are also being invited to the uh, statutory partner meetings in anticipation of education becoming a statutory partner a bit further down the line. And uh, we, you know, we, we, we can obviously feed back to you on that. In terms of the what that means for you, uh, in terms of safeguarding arrangements in Essex, it means that there is a conduit between yourself as education settings and the ESCB. So you have plenty of opportunity to um, to raise any concerns either through your head teacher associations or or through through my team. Um, but it also means that actually you receive information hot off the press from the ESCB because any learning from any child safeguarding practice reviews, any changes around effective support or within social care or from other partners, we disseminate uh, to you pr pretty swiftly, really. It's um, it, 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 we're, we're able to be very responsive to any to any learning that's identified and, and certainly learning from multi-agency case audits, child safeguarding practice reviews. We are constantly reviewing those and feeding that learning back through our resources, our materials, our model policies, etc. So it's quite a dynamic process, really. And I think in Essex, we are uh, we have an established process and we're quite a, a, a way forward um, uh, compared to other local authorities. So I think it's quite helpful for you to know and understand that. And um, and again, sometimes Ofsted may ask about that in terms of where you get learning from CSPRs and where you get learning from the, from the Safeguarding Children Board, and that's your response, really. So I, uh, other sections there, as you can see, it covers a range of topics. Section seven is um, other safeguarding issues, and I, I referred previously to the um, uh, to, to sort of technology um, themed issues. And uh, as you can see there, there's reference to own devices on site, and 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 again the artificial intelligence. So uh, we will see what the final uh, document looks like. Um, but we have a year to wait, so watch this space. Thanks, Derry. Don't get too excited at this point. So, as always, we bring you uh, an update, your prevent update, and um, and I apologise in all the uh, in all the quadrant forums because I know I use this language every time, but I'm conscious that there may be new people. Um, hearing this language, and a reminder for those of you who've heard it before. So I'm the Education Prevent Lead and uh, I, so termly I have access to the Counter-Terrorism Local Profile, the CTLP. That in itself is a highly confidential document uh, and, and we're not able to share the whole document with you, and, and nor do you need the whole document. But what I am able to do is bring to you the headline data so that you have current information about what prevent looks like in your locality so just a reminder that you are required as education settings to have a risk assessment around prevent <clears throat> and uh, there are some model uh, templates on essex school info link so again just to remind you the home office did produce uh, risk assessment template for there's a version for early years, a version for primary and one for secondary. We had already been thinking about a, an Essex template for a prevent risk assessment for settings. So <clears throat> what we did was have a look at the Home Office one and we have produced um, 
we produced an Essex version as well. I'm not saying it's better than the Home Office. It's just slightly, probably slightly shorter, um, a, 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 a bit more localised, really, a bit more tailored to, to Essex. What we will do from September is um, pre-populate that with some of the information that I share at the safeguarding forums, safeguarding briefings, so that that will give you um, a, a, a basis really for, for your own risk assessment. As I say, we'll produce that termly, we'll update it termly, and then you can, uh, you can take that template and adapt it to meet the needs of your individual setting. But it might be helpful, again, we get calls from settings saying, what on earth do I put in a, in a prevent risk assessment? So uh, we can give you some guide around that really. So, for example, there will be a lot around online uh, online safety uh, because we know that radicalisation of vulnerable children, vulnerable adults takes place online. And uh, so what do you as an education setting do uh, to mitigate the risk around that? But we'll have a look at that over the summer. And as I say, we'll share that with you for uh, for next term. So in terms of the headline data, the UK threat level remains uh, substantial and it has been substantial for um, probably a couple of years now. I keep meaning to look that up every time I say that, um, but it has been a couple of years uh, now, I believe. The um, primary threat in terms of the most prevalent ideology uh, is from is Islamic extremist group and also from uh, extreme far right uh, mindset and ideology. So over the last quarter, there was a slight increase in Islamic extremist referrals and a slight decrease in extreme right wing referrals and MUU. MUU is mixed, unclear and unstable and really it, it does what it says on the tin. It's not one um, <clears throat> one specific belief system or, or ideology that the individual has, it, it, it can be a mixture of, uh, of one or more, or it's unclear what the, um, what, what the ideology is. So you'll be pleased to know that over 80% of cases are closed before case management is required. So in those cases, it's where there has uh, been an, a, a vulnerability identified, but there is no counter-terrorism ideology or, or counter-terrorism risk identified. And, uh, and as you can see there on that final point, over 50% of channel panel cases are for the 13 to 17 year old age range, which is a concern for us in education because that's a growing cohort. So we need to think about that in terms of how we protect our young people from being radicalised online. And, um, and I know schools are already doing lots of work around that, but we, um, we, we, it is cause for concern because it's a cohort that's, grow, that's growing in terms of the under 18 year olds. And as you can see there, just under 20% of cases at Channel Panel are for the 18 to 24 year old um, age group. So you, you can see there that 70%, uh, just over 70% of our cases are for under 25s, um, which is a bit of an issue, isn't it, for us? So remember that we are talking about very low numbers when we're talking about prevent referrals and channel panel referrals. And as you can see there, we had 28 referrals uh, across the region in the last quarter. The majority of those were from education um, and, and continue to be. So uh, I, again, those of you who have been to previous forums will know that education is the highest referrer and that is in Essex regionally and nationally. And, um, and and as I said, the majority, so the same applies here, the majority uh, did not present any uh, CT ideology or risk. Thanks, uh, Darren. So I just wanted to remind you of the information on Essex School Info Link around Prevent. So Essex School Info Link has been reorganised. You've probably all picked that up now. Um, but there is still a dedicated section on prevent and uh, the the link at the top there is to the prevent homepage 
and then the sections below are, are the sections you can go into those pages to, um, to, to seek more information on all of those things. I just wanted to uh, make you aware that we are we have been doing some work with the prevent police team because they have raised a concern that there are uh, that they are picking up referrals that shouldn't really be a prevent referral and they uh, there's a couple of things uh, related to that really so we have put together a checklist to guide you as education settings through that referral form process so to, to prompt you with um uh, sort of information and guide you through the through the form itself in terms of how to complete it and um and hopefully that will be helpful. I have to say that we we were just on the verge of um, sending that out and the, the uh, referral forms being updated. So we need to go through and do a check that actually our guidance notes matches the, that they match the new uh, new referral form. But once we've had an opportunity to do that, we'll, we'll send that out. And the new referral form will, of course, also be going on Essex School Info Link. But also linked to that in terms of what to do if you have concerns. I just wanted to remind you that you can always come through to Max or myself if you if there is a case that you wish to discuss, or you can go direct to the Prevent Police team and, and their contact details are on Essex School Info Link. So you can go through to that team and have a conversation with them so that we are not submitting referrals that, that actually shouldn't be submitted because once they're in the police system, there is a record of that and the police have to respond to it. So if it's something that could be redirected or you know just does, does not need to come to the police at all, then it's appropriate that it is redirected or uh, you know that, that there's another intervention agreed upon. If you have uh, concerns that the child is at risk of uh, significant harm or you feel there are other um, child protection issues that, that exist within that case, that there are those concerns around that child or family, then you would go through the hub instead and have that conversation with them and they may then direct you to the Prevent Police team. So it's really just you thinking about how, where to go for what, you know, what, what's the underlying problem and who do you need to speak to about that? And, uh, and we can hopefully improve the, uh, the conversion rate then with the uh, Prevent Police team. Okay, thank you, uh, Darren. So some other bits from me really. So just a reminder that we will um, be sharing the prejudice related and hate motivated incidents guidance with you. Sorry, that is a bit of a mouthful, but um, we've, uh, the, the, we felt that was reflective of what the guidance is talking about, and it's um, that's been in discussion with the uh, police really in terms of uh, the the language around that. So we have started work on that document. I am um, <laughs> we're not I've not done the, we've not done loads of it. I have to say, but we have started work on it, and we will bring that to you at some point in the autumn term. We are hoping, but. Just a reminder that that came from the uh, information within the last safeguarding audit that, that we asked you to complete for the ESCB and um, what what that all, what what the findings from the audit told us, which was um, no surprise, is that set, not all settings are um, ha have sort of strong reporting systems around this. Um, settings aren't clear where to go for help, um, either for, for them to receive support around an incident or where to signpost children or families following an incident. And that could be either for the victim or the perpetrator, if I use that language. Um, so we will do uh, we will do some work around all that and bring that into the guidance document and and as always we will provide templates as part of that guidance document so for example there will be a reporting template which will hopefully bring some consistency 
to reporting across all settings and it will also again guide you through the process in terms of what information you need to be recording uh, in relation to these incidents and uh, and we'll look at what um, uh, what what training we can support settings with around that <clears throat> so again watch this space and we'll bring we'll bring that to you at some point in the autumn term hopefully uh, Steve Whitfield and myself are working on a um, uh, let's talk document and and um, his team have uh, have produced a draft document uh, that, that Steve and I will be looking at over the summer. So this is around managing risk for children with mental health issues and um, and it's it's around supporting settings in managing cases where there are high levels of risk. So um, we know that many settings and particularly in secondary, but, but not exclusively secondary age children, that settings are dealing with um, some very concerning cases in terms of high levels of self-harm and the risk associated with that. So this document <clears throat> will hopefully support you with that, support you with the risk assessment process and in um, and in your school response and when to pull in other agencies. We are working with CAMS on that document, which is very helpful in terms of their input. And again, we hope to bring that to you for the autumn term. So it's that time of year again, um, child protection file transfer. Again, I haven't got time to go into that in detail but just to say that the guidance document to support with that is in our, it is on Essex school info link and uh, and please do ensure that you are uh, starting to look at your child protection files in anticipation of sending them to the new setting for any pupils you are losing. Uh, a reminder that you do need to um, have a bit of a, well, not cleansing exercise, but, but a tidy up really. So please, wherever possible, remove, remove any duplicated documents. Um, do, do ensure they're in uh, chronological order and um, and please do ensure that it's relevant information on there and, and the child protection file should consist of just child protection information not um, not information around behavior unless that is recorded specifically because there is a child protection issue around that but it shouldn't just be reams of behavior incidents either um, because that's something actually that's come up as an issue um, for, for some schools at the uh, Quadrant Forum. So please do ensure that the information on there relates specifically to safeguarding and that it's relevant. Um, but as I say, there is the guidance on uh, the guidance document on Essex School Info Link for you to have a look at around that. So I've talked about the fact that Essex School Info Link has been updated. Hopefully you've all um, been on and uh, seen the, the new website or the new platform. I don't know what it's called, but um, but I, I, I think it's a lot better. Actually, it, it, it certainly looks a lot clearer, I think. Um, and uh, and it seems easier to navigate and, and the search engine is better. So hopefully you are all finding the same. There is a feedback form there. Um, having said that, you can pick it up off, off InfoLink if you wanted to provide any feedback. Um, but uh, if there are any comments you wanted to make, um, I think positive or negative, then I've been asked to share that link with you so that so that you can do that. In terms of the safeguarding pages, they are still going through the process of um, uh, there will be some reorganisation because I won't bore you with the detail, but we had to, to, to do a bit of a lift and shift and, and we are reviewing some of those pages. Um, you will have picked up that some of the content is now in the secure area on Essex School Info Link. That doesn't affect you as um, settings at all because you have access to the secure area and you will still be able to access the same materials. But just to make you aware of that, um, it hasn't all disappeared. Uh, but as I say, if you want to provide any uh, any feedback on that, then, then you can use that link. 
So I just wanted to talk about the resources for next academic year. Um, it will, as always, be a very busy summer for us because we are updating everything that, that we produce. And, um, and it's always a bit of a mad rush, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, the more we produce, the more we've got to update. So, <laughs> so it grows every year, really. Um, but we, but we, we, we will be working on on that as soon as uh, as soon as we hit the holidays and it quietens down a little bit for us in terms of um, contact from school from schools. Uh, we will have all the materials on there by at the end of August. What what we will do, and I haven't had time to speak to, to the team yet properly in any great detail, um, but what we will think about doing is, is have a kind of notice board on the safeguarding homepage so that we can, I haven't really thought this through, but, but so that we will put on there the updated materials as we update them and uh, and, and, and we'll have due dates, expected dates for the other materials. So hopefully that will be helpful for you in that you can, um, when you are looking over the over the summer, you will see A, whether it's yet available or B, when it's due to be available. Uh, can I please stress, this is not that I'm expecting you to go on and look over the summer, but many, many, many schools contact us to ask for those resources before the beginning of term. So I know that you are going on and we're trying to make that as um, a, a simple a process as, as possible for you. But as I say, you need to bear with us because there are a lot of things we're updating. So we will be uh, updating all the level two training resources, the model policy, I was going to do a bit of an overhaul on the model child protection policy this summer, but actually in view of the fact that there are relatively minor changes for September and also the fact that um, there will be more changes coming for, for, for next September, it makes sense to do that overhaul next summer. Um, <clears throat> the uh, I, I have to say, you know, you, you will remember a time, I think some of you have been here longer than others, when we were having to update the model child protection policy quite a number of times during the academic year in response to, to changes. And thankfully, we don't really have that issue anymore. Um, so that that in itself is helpful but actually alongside that there's not been any significant issue this year that's been raised with me where I've had to amend the wording for any reason so if I use an example a couple of years ago I had a school contact me because the, they had a parent who was um, complaining and complaining um, quite a quite a lot about the fact that the school had allowed the police to interview their child on site and they hadn't been informed. Now there was reference to that within the child protection policy in that schools are allowed to do that um, but actually uh, in response to that I just changed the wording to, to strengthen that really. So just to use that as an, as an example there's not been anything like that raised this year. So it will be minor tweaks to the child protection policy and again we'll get that on there as soon as possible but certainly in terms of the um, level two training uh, 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 again we'll get that on there ASAP. Uh, we will look at um, providing the inspecting safeguarding uh, training presentation as well which we, we had written for last year and then pulled it because the um, inspecting safeguarding document was um, was pulled by Ofsted. So again, I'm quite interested to see whether they reintroduce that for this year, um, because I thought that was quite a, a, a helpful separate guidance document, really. Um, so I've not heard that they will be producing that. Um, but, but again, watch this space, really. So I think that's probably all on the resources. Alex, Derry, have I missed anything or are there any questions about that? No, no questions, um, just apart from the level two, but I've said that that will all be on there as well. Um, 
Can I just ask anybody who hasn't signed in via the chat to do so, please? Because we're a few short on the register, if that's all right. Thank you. Yeah, please, please, please do sign in um, so that uh, we, we, we've got a log of who's attending because I'll talk about this in a minute, but actually we're looking at, um, at our training offer for next year. Um, that, uh, that last section, allegations of, uh, against head teachers, uh, about head teachers, it was just to uh, let you know that um, following a couple of incidents that I was involved with, that I've spoken to the children's safeguarding team about um, being routinely informed where there is an allegation about a head teacher, and that's around providing some support because where it's a member of staff in school, the head teacher is able to um, have that strategic oversight and provide uh, support for, for the member of staff or signpost them. Actually, that's not the case for a head teacher. I mean, it is the responsibility of the chair of governors, but um, but the, but that's what that section is about. And um, I, 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 I've talked uh, about that more in the in-person sessions. So, uh, but just to make you uh, aware of that. OK, thanks, Dory. So there is a lot to talk about in terms of the working together to improve attendance uh, <coughs> statutory guidance document, then that's due to come into effect in August. Now, again, we don't have detail, uh, have time to go into sufficient detail about that in this session. Uh, but again, we've talked about it um, quite a bit at the in-person sessions. So. Um, there will be more to come on that. I'm going to um, I'm going to move on from that only in the sense that I'm going to be talking about the effective support document. So I will come back to uh, attendance as part of uh, that that discussion in a minute. Um, but but just to let you know, in terms of uh, attendance, clearly there is a very strong link with safeguarding and with your safeguarding processes around, around attendance and welfare checks, et cetera. Um, but also uh, in terms of a multi-agency response to improving attendance. And if you think about your two categories, you've got persistent absence, you've got severe absence, um, and, and particularly in the case of severe absentees, then you really should be looking at, at a multi-agency response to that. And there are lots of conversations going on with other agencies, but also within, um, within Essex County Council, within the local authority, about building capacity to support schools uh, around improving attendance on individual cases. So, as I say, I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about the effective support document, um, but but we haven't got time to have the discussion that we've had we've had elsewhere. And um, the what what I will just say on that is that the document does uh, refer to a local authority response around attendance, specifically a social care response uh, to to poor attendance. And um, and I've been having discussions with uh, colleagues in social care around that. <clears throat> We're not going to see any significant changes to um, to processes around that because actually, unless poor attendance is seen in the context of neglect, parental neglect, there there will not really be a role for social care because if you've got a child who is not attending their provision because of um, uh, perhaps an underlying mental health issue, but the parent is supportive and is engaging with the appropriate services around that, then there would be no role for social care. So why would there be a social care response? If it is, um, I don't know, a bullying issue, for example, there won't, I mean, there may be something there around peer on peer abuse, child on child abuse, um, but uh, but but actually there's not necessarily a response for, uh, from social care that's required. So, you know, if if we're talking about a response from social care, it will need to be in the context of neglectful parent behaviour 
and uh, and the impact that that poor attendance is having on the child's social, uh, emotional, and 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 possibly physical de development. So, uh, uh, say that other discussions to have in in other forums about that, but a lot of work is being done about it. So I just wanted to make you aware that we have been, um, or we have completed now, um, behaviour behavior and safeguarding reviews um, across all our enhanced provisions. And um, I just thought it's helpful for you as placing schools in those provisions, you're placing your children in those provisions, that you are aware that we have done those reviews. I have to say they were all overwhelmingly positive. There's some really fantastic work going on uh, out in our enhanced provisions. I mean, there's some brilliant work going on in our schools as well. But um, but but you'll be pleased to know those of you who are placing children in the enhanced provision that um, that that they all came out very positively. So uh, so well done to all those involved. And as I say, for, for your information, that's reassuring for you as um, as as the placing school. There's the link there for the senior mental health lead training. As you can see from the figures there, we've actually had very good response in Essex anyway, in terms of the number of settings that have accessed that. Um, but, but the link is there if you haven't already done that. And then finally on this slide is just a reminder of the training that's available through our SEMH team. And again, many of you will be familiar with the SEMH team and what they offer. Um, and it's that team that has uh, rolled out the trauma perceptive practice um, program, uh, TPP for families. There's a best practice recognition um, scheme running and uh, you can submit any uh, best practice to the SMH team and they upload that on their uh, on their website. Um, I, I think the other thing then to draw particular attention to is the price training. So just a reminder that we have um, a partnership with Price in respect of physical intervention training and uh, a number of schools have have accessed that already. The feedback, the evaluation that we've had from that has been really positive. So I say that from the evaluations completed after the after the course, but also feedback that we've had through the quadrant forums when I've uh, when I've talked about it there. So uh, so just a reminder that that training is available. There is a cost to it because we price deliver it for us on uh, on our behalf. But it's price they would be our preferred provider in terms of um, in terms of best practice. If you if you are a setting that operates TPP, then you do not have to do the full course because the um, TPP program would count towards the initial uh, stages of the training from price uh, in terms of de-escalation and being proactive around how you support and understand behaviour. And lastly on there, um, there's the uh, physical activity to support wellbeing uh, programme that's been delivered through Active Essex. And again, you can access details of that on the um, on the SEMH website. Thanks, Derry. So I just wanted to talk about uh, safeguarding training and to remind you of the training that we are running. And we are we we are running a lot of training at the moment. Um, and, and today we were delivering um, the it could happen here. We haven't taken it off the side because it was literally this morning. Um, but um, but but we've been running uh, that training this morning. We, we, we continue to run the um, prevent awareness training and this is in the it's really to fill a gap um, because the home office has still not shared its replacement for the rat training so again those of you who regularly attend the forums will know that I have been saying the, um, the, the the home office prevent training is imminent. It's still imminent. It's a little bit more imminent than it was last term, I think, in that we are now expecting it for July. Um, bearing in mind that's next month. Uh, so again, I'm not holding my breath. I stopped holding my breath about three years ago, waiting for this. 
But um, in the meantime, we are providing that termly online uh, session for prevent leads and say so it's a general awareness and uh, and update for schools well for prevent leads in in schools and settings uh, similarly we continue to run the termly online harmful sexual behavior awareness and update so you do there's no requirement to do any of these of course but it's um if you wanted a refresher of hsb training then please feel free to join us um if you've done the brook traffic light tool training it is um it's obviously consistent with the principles in the in the tlt training um but it is our own version of the training um and uh, and based on keeping children safe in education and other statutory requirements. So as I say, if you want a refresher on that or if you're new to the role and you want training around harmful sexual behaviour, again, do feel um, do feel free to to join us. And uh, and the next one is um, Thursday. Uh, the it could happen here is around allegations about members of staff and um, we will run that again probably uh, late autumn or early spring so we're we're kind of running those every six months or so uh, they are in person and um, and will continue to be uh, we don't have another date for that at the moment but, but as I say we'll, we will offer that again later in the year or early next year and just a reminder of the safeguarding forum for governors which is tonight and um, bit, bit short notice now for your governors for this evening if they're not coming but but just a reminder to speak to your safeguarding governor and or your chair because um we again we continue to run those termly it is online and um and we will continue to run those. We have quite good engagement from governors around that. It's a bit of a growing uh, audience. Uh, and as I say, we, we, we'll continue to run that. It's just an hour each term. Um, and, and obviously you're at the online forum today. Uh, so I won't go into that. Thanks. Um, thanks, Terry. So a reminder that we also run termly online a briefing for new head teachers and and dsls and um clearly if you're here you're not a new one of either but if you are expecting a new dsl or a new head teacher for next term then please do signpost them to uh, to that session and it, essentially it's a bit of a whistle stop tour of safeguarding in essex um as a as a stop gap prior to them uh, accessing their level three training, their, their DSL training. Uh, so we do have quite a number of settings uh, join that now. I mean, you're welcome to drop in, it's online, so it makes no difference to us. If Again, if you wanted a bit of a, a, a an oversight, a, a, a overview of, um, of safeguarding in Essex, but I would hope that you're all pretty aware of all that anyway. But we do have some schools join, uh, some more experienced DSLs join if uh, um, they, they, they find that helpful as a reminder, really. Uh, Cyber Choices Training is a new course and it's being run by Essex Police. And uh, we will be having a look at the content of that with them, because I'll be honest, I haven't even seen the content of that yet. As I say, it's a, it, it's a completely new course, um, but, but I will have a look at it before September. So again, just an hour online, uh, do join that if you want to. And all these are available for booking on the education uh, training booking system. And... Um, the harmful sexual behaviour training that I've talked about already, that, that's for the 11th of December next term. So again, if you've got a new DSL, you might want to signpost them to that for, for next term. The LGBTQ training, uh, we were due to, we, we put on a session in October, last October. We were due to hold a further session in July and and i've put it back now to october and the reason for that is because uh the gender questioning guidance came out from the dfe the the, the draft document and 
we will see really what's going to happen in September in terms of what that document looks like um, and, 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 and whether there will be any changes to it, given that we have, have an election coming up as well. So, um, and I don't know if that will influence it in, in any way, but with, with, as with all these draft documents, um, it, it, we, we, we'll want to see the finalised version. We'll see where we are in September, because if if there is talk of it then being released in January, we'll, we'll put the training back again, because there's no point in training up a, a whole load of schools and then the uh, uh, and then the statutory guidance changes. So again, watch this space on that. But at the moment, it is available for booking um, for, for that October date. <clears throat> and then lastly, we've just got the dates on there for the um, safeguarding forums for autumn. And um, we are we are reviewing. Oh, you've got you you've jumped ahead of yourself. You got too excited, Dere. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come on to that in a minute. But we, we are reviewing our, our our training offer for next year. And and Dere's given you a sneak preview of why. But um we 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 are considering the forums as as part of uh, the, the review we're doing around all our training. Um but they are the dates on the basis we will be running, uh, continuing to run in-person quadrant forums next term or next year. They they are the dates for those of you, if you're a primary head teacher, you know that they take place in the afternoon. Um, we will we will consider that in the alongside the numbers of the online forum and, and feedback we get about this. Um, and, and, and we'll be looking at it in the in the wider context of all the training we offer. Now that brings me on to the next slide. Thanks, Terry. Because one of the one of the things that we are looking at going forward is is an offer of level three training for DSLs in education settings. And the reason I'm bringing this to you today is that we are looking at this for October, no, not for October, for, for autumn, um, but for next academic year. Now, we've been asked by a number of settings for uh, over a period of time, actually, to whether there could be a local authority level three training offer. So we are currently scoping this. Um, what I would be really grateful for today, and I'll tell you a little bit about it in a minute in terms of what we think it will look like so far. Um, but what we are looking for today, please, is um, it, 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 our expressions of interest uh, as to whether you think it, it, it's something you would want to think about for next academic year. If you scan that code, it takes you to a questionnaire. Sorry to ask you to complete another questionnaire, but I'm grabbing you while you're here. <clears throat> because it would be really helpful to know if you're thinking, no, I'm absolutely not interested. Sorry, my voice is going. Um, I'm absolutely not interested. Then it would be useful to know that too, please. And that's absolutely fine, of course. Um, but it would be helpful for us to know that because we are currently looking at what that business model will look like. We're currently costing it. And, and uh, if we are going ahead with it, I will need to recruit. And um, and obviously there will be implications uh, around that for, for myself and the local authorities. So we would be really grateful if, uh, if you could complete that uh, questionnaire for us just to give us some idea of demand and what will the, what that will look like for the next academic year. Um, so what what I can tell you is that it, it will be in person. I feel there is some training that can take place online and I think there is some that shouldn't and I think safeguarding training for, for you to do it, for DSLs to do it uh, once every couple of years um, I think it should be in person because it gives you the opportunity to come out of the setting to have some thinking space and you need thinking space around the training and, uh, and, and it gives you the opportunity to have those discussions and 
uh, you know, for it to be more participative than um, that than sitting online or um, you know just just listening to it. Really, in terms of in terms of what the training will consist of. I don't want it to be just regurgitating keeping children safe in education. We obviously will need to touch on that. We will need to cover other key statutory guidance, but actually it will be much more around your role as the DSL and what are the requirements around that and what does safeguarding look like in Essex to support you with undertaking that role. So, I think the what we're able to offer is um, is that we have got all that information hot off the press. We we are fully immersed in safeguarding in Essex, and um, and as it happens, we know it and you hear it. Really, it's a bit linked back to what I was saying earlier in terms of our working partnerships with the ESCB, social care, and police. So. Um, I think it also it it means the training will be sort of dynamic, really. I talk about risk assessments being dynamic. Our training will be dynamic in that it will be very current and we're able to be responsive and again feed any learning and any current issues and any current key messages back through um, you know back through those level three training sessions. Now, in that context, if we go ahead and, and deliver DSL training, then we will rethink what we're doing around the forum. So it might be uh, that if we do go ahead with the level three training offer, that we move all the safeguarding forums online. I'm a bit loath to do that because when I've said that in the, um, in the quadrant forums, um, they, uh, and I've had quite a bit of feedback since that, that many people like the in-person um, safeguarding forums as well. So, and of course, not everyone is going to use our level three training. I don't imagine for a minute that you know we're going to have six hundred schools and every DSL accessing le the level three. So, we want to provide what's helpful to you as settings and what best supports you in your role as DSLs. But um, but but why wouldn't we want to deliver the level three training for our DSLs? Because we have an opportunity to shape it and 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 influence um, influence practice and and consistency uh, across all our settings. And and again, many of you will have heard me say this before. But I think one of the strengths we have in Essex around safeguarding. I I mean, first of all, we have brilliant engagement with our settings, whatever the status uh, around safeguarding. Um, but uh, but actually we have a really consistent approach because the vast majority of settings attend the forums, the, va uh, the, the vast majority of settings use the materials in some form or another. Again, I don't I don't mean everyone uses everything, of course they don't, but but we have got a really strong consistent approach across uh, across Essex, including uh, the impact that we're starting to have in early years now as well. So um, so I, it will be interesting to see what the response is. As I say, this is in response to requests from settings for us to deliver it. Um, but uh, but but please do complete that and just give us some idea because it will really help with um, with pulling together costings and um, oh and I haven't mentioned costings yet. So that's the key bit, I suppose. So the it, it will be under two hundred pound for the in person uh, session. It will probably be, but don't hold me to this. But it will probably be. 185, 195 around around there. But again, it does depend on demand. And we're not extending it to early years at the moment, but but we will be looking a bit further down the line. So as I say, final plea on that, please, um, would be really grateful if you would indicate your your interest or your complete lack of interest. I, either, either would be welcome. So thank you in advance of that. OK, Alex, is there anything in the chat around any of that? <clears throat> no, there's just one query I'm going to speak to a school about through the inbox. So, no, that's fine. OK. Thank you. Right. Um, Derry, next slide then, please. So I said 
I'd like to touch on the effective support document. So this is, again, for those of you who have been attending the forums for years, this is the document that I used to stand up and wave around, but it's fallen apart now, so I can't. And uh, and actually, it's all moved on online. Um, <clears throat> it, the, the, the document was first written around 10, 11 years ago, and it is having a major revamp. It's had tweaks over the last 10, 11 years, but it needs a complete overhaul, really. So that's what we are in the process of doing uh, at the moment. So the ESCB is obviously leading on that. It is an ESCB document, but we have been involved in those discussions and, and we've had an opportunity to comment. Now, the time scale for the new document is, um, is for release next term, but I'm very conscious, of course, we've got the summer coming up and you will all be going off for the summer and, um, and, and we want to be able to give education settings the opportunity to view the draft document and comment on it because you are the people working with it. So they are aiming to send that out for consultation to settings, I think either later this week, more likely next week, I would say, um, so that you have an opportunity to look at it um, before the, the break. And hopefully many of you will um, have, have, the, have, the, um, have, the, have some time to be able to do that and at least have a, have a quick look at it. The format has changed. I'm not going to go through the whole document, um, but the, um, the format has changed. If you remember, it's the document that lists the indicators under each level of need on the windscreen of need each level of concern on the windscreen of need and what what the uh, new format is that that will all be on one um one graph one not one graph one table so that you can look at the indicators side by side to decide at what level um, really they, they sit. They continue to be under various headings such as personal development, health needs, education needs. Attendance is, um, it, it, it runs through the document really, it, so it, it puts attendance firmly in there as a concern uh, and uh, you know a, a concern requ requiring a response. So You'll see um, you'll see the new format when you when you get the draft document. But as I say, hopefully you will have a have a chance to look at that before uh, before you go off. So just to make you aware that that is coming alongside that, I said I would um, I said I would return to attendance. The only the only th other thing I wanted to say on that is that in terms of um, uh, the early help, if you again, if you think about the, the windscreen of needs in terms of the early help, then um, it is um, it, we need to think about how we build capacity around improving attendance at that at, at that early help stage. And uh, and as I said earlier, we're having discussions. I'm having discussions with other agencies about what that will look like. Uh, including the child and family wellbeing service, includes uh, so so health, um, and uh, and very much um, colleagues in social care, family solutions specifically, and um, and the attendance specialists. So we are pulling all of those discussions together to um, to, to to think about what that might look at and again that will be reflected in the effective support document in the final document <clears throat> which will be helpful i think because it strengthens um our ability to pull other partners in not that they're not receptive to being pulled in i have to say but but just so that there is a framework within which we all operate one of the things that i'm looking at doing if you think about um the children and young people's response plan that, that I wrote during lockdown, uh, where it set out the, um, the 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 agencies to contact when when the majority of children weren't in school, and um, it, it it set out the concerns and then the response really. So who do you contact? What should that support look like at the various levels of intervention? So I will have a look at doing something like that. Um, based on attendance, poor attendance. So again, that, that might be helpful. We are pulling together a guidance document 
four schools, um, four settings that will pull together again all the statutory guidance, uh, all, 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 the, all the other relevant documentation around it. And again, there will um, be a series of um, templates and tools attached to that. So many of you will have heard Anita Patel Lingham talking about this um, in terms of, uh, of attendance compliance, but I'm very much interested in it in terms of the safeguarding issues and, and the impacts on children and actually the risk they are exposed to when they're not in school. And, uh, and again, I know many of you are dealing with um, some really concerning cases in terms of that and uh, uh, and you phone us about them and, that, and that's fine. Um, to have those conversations, but it is obviously a, a, a great concern that when children aren't in school, and we know from the child safeguarding practice reviews that have emerged since lockdown, what a huge protective factor education is, um, because we do in the main have eyes and ears on, on all those children, and, and very sadly and not surprisingly, there were some very serious, tragic cases during lockdown when children weren't in school and they didn't have that that protective factor of school or nursery around them. So it's really important um, that that we get this right. So okay, um, just moving on then, please, Dere. Um, in terms of the, I've talked about that really. So uh, just to say very quickly on that, one of the di one of the discussions that are going that is going on elsewhere is around building capacity within the TAFSO team, so that they in turn build capacity around early help and support plans, early help plans for for children and families, and they are running um, a pilot around enhanced level two support. Again, I haven't got time to go into that in great detail today, and there will be other information coming out to you. Um, but that is something that is uh, it, it has, in fact, um, started the pilot. Linked to that is the um, anyone attending the early help drop ins. Again, the TAFSO will what's coming from those early help drop ins now is that the uh, an early help plan will be produced as a result of that discussion and sent to you as the professional who's brought the, the case to that forum uh, for, for you to adapt and use with the family. So again, we will keep an eye on that in terms of, of, of of what that looks like. But uh, again, we've had some quite positive feedback about that already. I don't know whether anyone here has um, has benefit, benefited from that yet. Uh, just a reminder that you can pop into any of the early help drop-ins. It doesn't have to be the one specific to your area. So there is a panel of people at each of those drop-ins and you can you, so you can go to uh, to any one of them and receive that support and advice. OK, thanks, Derry. <clears throat> and again, next, uh, next one. So are there, um, again, just before I move on, are there any comments in the chat or questions that? There's one comment just about, um, there's a nice windscreen of need used as part of the SCN school offer. Um, that's the head at St Michael's. I don't know whether you, that's something you've created. Head at St Michael's. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I've seen I've seen it on another school website, but I'm in the process of completing it myself for our own um, send offer. But I just thought actually it sounds like it might be quite nice to do it for our attendance offer as well and our early help. It's yeah. such a visual that's the thing, and then it's all married yeah. together, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it is that. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for that. And it, it is around the. Um, uh, 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 again, when you're familiar with the format, it's very yeah. helpful, isn't it? We're not trying yeah. to reinvent loads of things here. Yeah. It's all, all, all these are all to try to um, to support you. Yeah. And then we've just got a question. Do schools arrange and chair the TAF meetings? It was easier to talk about it than uh, write it. So it's so yes and no. So it will depend on who has the initial concern because if 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 it's school that has the main concerns, then yes, but they can seek support from the TAFSO. 
And the pilot that I've talked about is around building capacity within the TAPSO team through additional funding they've received through the Violence and Vulnerability Unit. And we're also looking to, um, to secure additional funding through the Supporting Families funding stream. Um, so, yes, you could, but it doesn't have to be school if there's another agency that where it's more appropriate for another agency to lead that process. And finally, Nick Hutchings has got his hand up. Nick. Nick, Hi. hello. Hi. Um, just a quick question on capacity for TAFSOs, please. Um, how, what, what additional capacity are you looking for? Because the TAFSOs are great. They're really, really good and they're very, very helpful as a third party outside of when relationships are strange between families. But this is not complaint. But I've had a couple of meetings where TAFSO has refused to um, come because there weren't enough agencies involved, even though we had put the, the invites out. So that put us in a difficult position to run those meetings. So I'm interested in how many additionals you're trying to get because they are excellent. Yeah, and it is around having additional posts. But again, if you're having those kinds of issues, Nick, then let, let me know, because that's the kind of thing that, that I want to be feeding back, because we need this process to work. And, and the discussion has been around how we collectively, within the local authority, build capacity around, um, around the early help offer. And as I say, I'm coming at it from, I mean, I'm interested in all safeguarding, obviously, but at the moment, specifically around attendance and supporting that, well, supporting, yeah, supporting attendance, responding to absence. Okay, thanks. So at the moment, we don't know the number. Uh, the specific number, no. I think there are. I think there are four additional TAFSOs, but don't quote me on that. Uh, but but as I say, we're looking at other. Well, not we. They are looking at other funding streams as well, Nick. So with a view to including the um, the other thing is that they are looking at um, uh, uh, joining TAP meetings via Teams. To build their again to build their capacity because they won't have the travel time in between. So I know a number of schools are holding their TAFs via Teams, but uh, either either that via Teams or a hybrid model. Um, well, but, yeah, they, uh, they work very well, Joe, for engagement. I mean, I've had a, a TAF meeting where the parent has actually been having a tattoo at the time, but it was the best way to get hold of the parent to get them to engage. So I'm saying the TAF is an excellent service. It just, yeah. they're obviously over capacity because there's another thing coming up here saying that they'll only attend the first meeting. So, you know, they're obviously needed. So I would be saying, yeah, go for the funding and uh, and get more in. Yeah, and we all, again, you've heard me say before, Nick, we always get really good feedback about the um, about the TAFSOs, they're, 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 they're a valued service because again they're providing some additional capacity to your schools aren't they and it is about that multi-agency and this is what I mean about the effective support document in that we want to strengthen that to pull more agencies in earlier on in the process and they're the discussions that I'm having elsewhere around these cases. Okay is um is that that's everything, that's that's everything. everything. Moment, yeah. okay fine thank you so i talked earlier about feeding back to you about any learning from work going on elsewhere and um, again many of you will be aware that the essex safeguarding children board oversee multi-agency case reviews and multi-agency thematic audits as well as child safeguarding practice reviews, CSPRs, which are, so CSPRs sit under national statutory guidance in terms of a process. The, <clears throat> the themed audits and the case audits are a separate internal quality, uh, quality assurance process that, that, that's undertaken across uh, agencies in Essex. And as I say, that's overseen by the ESCB. So um, I've got some slides here and, and we will share the slides with you. I'm not going to go through them in any great detail because, again, we don't have time to um, do that as part of this session. And then I have, so I'm just going to spend, in view of the time, I'm just going to spend uh, five minutes or so on those. And then I just want to um, speak to you, uh, make you aware of a, of a CSPR that will be um, that will be shared with professionals in, in the near future. 
So um, na next slide, please. Um, please, Terry. So the, uh, and in fact, I might not even talk through the slides because they're very wordy. But but the, um, the so there was the theme audit on neglect. Yeah, keep going through, please, uh, please, Terry. Number of agencies took part. Took part. So these were the um, findings, really, from the uh, from from the process, and I'll just go through these in a little more detail under each of the headings. But as I say, I'm not going to talk for ages on on them. You'll you'll get copies of the slides, and we will talk about all this at a later date. A lot of this, as I said earlier, a lot of the learning we've already fed back into our resources, our policies, and discussions that we've had at you had with you at, at previous forums. So um okay next slide please Derry. So de defining neglect. So, uh, uh, and we've had this conversation about other topics, haven't we? Um, the, the obvious one is harmful sexual behaviour, really. But what do we mean when we talk about harmful sexual behaviour? What What's the actual definition? Um, to, if I talk about significant neglect, is that what? Am I talking about the same thing as you? If you're talking about significant neglect, and as part of that, it's around what types of neglects exist and um you you can see there there's there's a number there that have uh, that have been identified and educational neglect is one of them and that obviously links strongly with the attendance absence that we've talked about today thanks derek so there is um there is a, a a risk assessment and that is being looked at and reviewed in in terms of the uh, format of that and we will have a proper look at that once there is a final template produced um a, a, an updated template and again we'll share that with you at, at the appropriate time when that's available thanks Derry. and it's talking about the whole system approach to neglect and uh uh, and again, questions really for agencies that came from uh, that, that, that came from the audit. So uh, again, you can see the reference there around early intervention. Again, if you think of the language within keeping children safe in education, it's around children and families receiving the right help at the right time, and how do we ensure that 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 happens? Um, I'll. I'll come on to medical uh, uh, on another slide. OK, ne next slide, please. And again, it fits with the, um, uh, you know, with, with, with the whole early help offer, doesn't it? Uh, so there's talk of a, um, a, a suite of practice tools there, as, as you can see. Uh, again, some of that will be around the um, language and understanding. So that's really important. Uh, again, I've talked about this at previous forums, but re re be really specific when when you're making a referral, but also in your own recording. So, you know, be very specific about what your concerns are and very specific about what the impact of that is on the child and particularly in the referral when you're doing that. So when you're talking about, for example, um, the children of poorly clothed or they have inappropriate clothing what does that mean what what does that mean and what's the impact does that mean that they don't have a coat in winter or does that mean that they never have any school uniform or any clean school uniform and there's a hygiene issue so be really specific about what the concern is and um and what the impact on on the child is thank you So recording systems, and again, how do you um, how do you flag high risk families across all services and agencies? I, that I mean, there's been discussion about that for certainly the last two decades, um, three decades really that I, that I've been involved. So you know, but how we we all know those families. You know those families when they arrive at your school at whatever age, and um, and again, it's about how they're 
how how we work with other agencies to address those concerns at the right time. One of the things we'll look at, because we're very good in education of uh, uh, working with chronologies, but one of the things we'll look at is um, a template for a genogram because they are used um, quite effectively in other services, particularly health and, uh, and social care. So we will look at, um, at whether we can produce a template for you on that, because it's quite helpful in mapping relationships across families and where you've got multiple families that share relations, then it can be quite helpful. But again, we'll have a look at that uh, and bring it to you at, at a later date. Thanks, Derry. So reflective discussions, I'm not going to say a great deal on this really. Um, again, we've not got time to go into it in any particular detail, but, but one of the challenges is how we do have those professional discussions about families in an appropriate way. And um, how you have an opportunity to share concerns with professionals where you have specific safeguarding concerns about a child. Now, <clears throat> we often hear about it's not appropriate to have that discussion or we can't talk to you about this because of GDPR and data protection and consent, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but keeping children safe in education is very clear that actually none of that should be a barrier to sharing information about children to keep them safe. And that GDPR and data protection should not be a barrier to, um, to, to safeguarding children. So how do we do that in an appropriate way? Um, interestingly, just thinking about the working together to improve attendance document, actually that strengthens our ability to talk to other settings. Um, where So if you've got a child in your setting where there is um, poor attendance, actually the document does um, condone, uh, allow you to speak to the setting where there's a sibling and, and I would strongly encourage you to be holding joint TAFs in those cases so that is bringing other professionals into that TAF meeting because I do, um, I, I, I am aware, I mean Nick's raised it here, but I am aware from discussions with other schools that that is, that is often an issue in terms of getting other professionals to, um, to attend TAFs. Okay, thanks Alex. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, so not one for us specifically, but more for police and social care in terms of thresholds um, around when there is criminal neglect and uh, and, and when parents uh, can and should be prosecuted where, where that's appropriate. Thank you. Next one, please, Derry. That's the last slide. Oh, OK, I thought there was another one after that. Oh, no, I'll cut some yeah. out. That's why. Thank you. <laughs> right. OK. Um, I, I was going to talk to you about a CSPR, but actually that brings us to, um, to five o'clock. So I will stop it there as I don't want to um, keep you later than, uh, than we said we would. So thank you for joining. And um, thank you for your time this afternoon. As I say, we will look at um, we will look at our training offer for next year in terms of whether we hold in person forums, whether we hold online forums, um, purely for you know purely one, purely the other, or or whether it's a mix of both. So feedback is really helpful, please. And again, do feel free just to put that in the. Um, in the chat. We have recorded this session um, on, on the basis that you will be able to share it with staff uh, with, with, within the, your setting um, because we know that settings have multiple DSLs and completely understand that not everyone's able to attend the in-person ones. So um, we will try to get a, 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 a sensible mix of both going forward. But um, but thank you all for attending. And if I don't see you, have a brilliant summer when it arrives. Have a great break. And thank you all for everything you do around safeguarding. Um, you do a brilliant job. Take care, everyone.